Hello, everyone, and welcome to the California's Water Crisis Leadership Opportunities for Environmental Health webinar. My name is Carla Blackmar, and I'm the Project Manager for the Public Health Alliance, and I will be moderating the webinar today. We've got a great agenda lined up, but before we get started, I want to take a moment to go over a few housekeeping items. All right. All right. So um, the recording and the slides for this presentation will be available after the webinar at the URL given there, and you'll receive an email that lets you know about that. Um, we will be recording this so that we can post that recording, um, just for your information. And everyone who's on the call today has joined in listen-only mode, which means that your audio lines are muted. However, at the end of the session, we'll have a brief Q&A, and if you want, you can raise your hand um, using the online panel, and that will make it possible for you to ask a question at that time. So the raise hand button is right here. Um, additionally, during the presentation, you can type questions into the question box here, and they will be submitted to our panelists, and we can answer those either as we go along, but most likely at the end of the session during the Q&A. If at any time during the call you have technical difficulties, you can either send a question to one of our staff, or you can go to webinar at, or you can call GoToWebinar at the number given here. All right. So this again is a call of the Public Health Alliance of Southern California. Um, our vision is Southern California communities are healthy, vibrant, and sustainable places to live. We are an alliance of nine local health communities in Southern California, including Orange, Long Beach, Los Angeles, Pasadena, Riverside, Santa Barbara, Santa, San Bernardino, San Diego, and Ventura, representing nearly 60% of the California population. Um, we're particularly pleased to be launching this first webinar in our in our environmental health webinar series track. It represents a continuing partnership between environmental health and chronic disease practitioners in Southern California. Last year, this partnership produced a series of seven webinars on how environmental health can support upstream prevention efforts. This year, we are pleased to launch a new webinar series tackling the questions facing the regulatory community as we respond to the changing water conditions and the corresponding rapidly changing political framework here in Southern California. For more information on about this series, you can check our website. You can also listen back to an introductory webinar on water and public health that was held last month by going and looking at our website. So just to get started here, I wanted to go ahead and do a poll. If you guys wouldn't mind going ahead and answering the following questions, what sector do you work in? And we'll just take a few minutes to get your feedback on that poll. And I see that we still have a lot of people who are just now coming onto the line. So go ahead as you come onto the line, and if you get a chance, please respond to the poll. We'll just maybe give it a little extra time, everybody, if that's OK. And this just gives our presenters an opportunity to see who we have on the call. OK. So maybe we'll go ahead and close that out. All right, so we've got, not surprisingly, since this is our environmental health series, 77% from environmental health and others from other, other sectors. Thank you for giving us a sense of where you're coming from today. We'll go back to our presentation. All right, so moving along. Sorry, everyone, I'm having a hard time. Okay. And then the second question that we have, we're going to do one other poll. Um, what region are you coming from today? We think we have quite a bit of geographic diversity. So if you'll just take a second to go ahead and fill that out, that would be great. Down here in Southern California, it's very nice and sunny today. So hopefully it's as lovely throughout the state. We'll just give it one more second and maybe close it out here. Okay, this is good. So we've got um, a representative, nearly 60% of the population from Southern California, and 23% from Northern California, and then um, some from the Central Valley and the Central Coast. So thank you, everyone, for joining us um, from all across the state. That's exciting. 
So we'll go ahead and continue on here. Slides to go. So today we're very honored um, to have Angelo Belomo and Carlos Borja um, on the line. Angelo Belomo is the Director of Environmental Health of the Environmental Health Division for the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. Mr. Belomo is, a lead, is leading current efforts of the department to reduce the health impacts of climate change while promoting the development of healthy, sustainable, and resilient communities. His 40-year career has included assignments in both, public, in both the public and private sectors, and his work has focused on the assessment and control of environmental health risks in communities throughout the state of California. He currently serves on the executive board of the California Conference of Directors of Environmental Health, CCDEH. We're particularly grateful to Angela because he's been our thought partner, visionary, and advisor in pulling this series together. And we're so pleased that he accepted our invitation to speak today to kick off the series. So thank you very, very much for joining us today, Angelo. In addition, we have a presentation from Carlos Borja, who is the Chief Environmental Health Specialist, Cross Connection and Water Pollution Control Program for the LA County Department of Public Health, Bureau of Environmental Protection. Carlos has been with LA County Environmental Health, Bureau of Environmental Protection, for about 19 years, serving as program director for the past six years. His interests and goals have revolved around the protection of potable water supplies within Los Angeles County, which, funnily enough, has led him to explore the benefits and hazards presented by non-potable water supply. We are fortunate to have him on the call today and to share, to share his insights on this topic. So again, thank you guys both so much for joining us, and we'll look forward to um, starting your presentations. So if you guys are able to speak, look forward to hearing you. Angelo, are you able to, uh, are you there? I am. Great, thank you. Thank okay, you for good. Us. Thank you very much, Carla, and uh, thanks also to the Alliance for their continuing efforts to bring environmental health in to talk with our public health colleagues on, um, in forums like today's where we can examine the roles we can play in tackling some of the biggest challenges facing society. I know just in the last couple of years since we've uh, begun in earnest this collaboration with the Alliance, we've highlighted uh, the roles that environmental health can play in chronic disease prevention, and certainly in the food system, energy and water production. And each of these systems uh, we've been able to explore together is really out of balance with natural capacity in the environment, which in turn affects our climate, our water, and our health, you know, the, the basics. Now these forums give us the chance to look at how we can work to improve sustainability in each of these systems, and that's what excites us in, in the county about uh, the collaboration. And included in that, I have to be sure to mention that we're also uh, working toward equity in how these systems both serve and impact populations both in our region and uh, elsewhere around the globe. Uh, as you mentioned, Carla, um, Carlos is our co-presenter today, and Carlos has really done an exceptional job not only of protecting our public water supplies for the time he's been with the department, but he's also leading our efforts to promote the development of alternative water systems, which he'll be speaking about. Um, and for those of you that may be joining this Water and Health series for the first time this morning, please do take time if you haven't, if you weren't here for the May 27th presentation to review it. We had a remarkable trio of panelists, including Linda Rudolph and Dick Jackson and Jay Famiglietti, and it was an outstanding presentation that really set the stage for the current state of water availability within our region, the implications this is having on public health, as well as the urgency for us to act. So this morning, we're going to transition and go beyond the problem itself and beyond our conventional regulatory roles in environmental health as it relates to water quality and consider potential new roles for environmental health in this area. So let me switch on the slide. Now, 
let me start with uh, just the session topics. I'm going to make a few remarks with regard to the case for environmental, le environmental health leadership in this area. We're going to move to Carlos's presentation, which will focus on alternative water. What is it? And we're going to look at some case studies where we've actually, in our local environmental health program, have assisted in the development of these systems. And then we'll open it up to questions. And before we go on, let me mention that although we've highlighted here in the second bullet what is alternative water, and that's what we'll be focusing on, our role in supporting the development of alternative water. There are other themes that we have to embrace in this area to ensure water capacity and an adequate water future in the state of California. And these additional roles deal with water conservation and efficiency, as well as preparing for water emergencies groundwater protection, and aquifer re restoration. We won't cover those topics in this morning's session, but they will be covered in subsequent sessions uh, in this series. Okay, uh, let's now move to the case for EH leadership. Um, in public health, there's really nothing more basic than an adequate water supply. And without one, even the healthiest of populations uh, can undergo rapid degradations in their health. Now, we're reminded of, of this every time there is a disrupt, disruption in the water supply. You know, very graphically, when we have an earthquake or a natural disaster around the world and water supplies are knocked out. It's something that's a little less apparent to us when we're dealing with an extended drought condition. But the, the threat is still there. It may be protracted. It may be a little longer term than, than, the, than the immediacy that uh, disruption on our water supply presents. But not having a reliable, sustainable supply of water has the same implications on a different time scale for public health. And that's why we're talking about this. And that's why you'll hear leaders in both public health and environmental health talking about the urgency to act. We don't have much time. And as Linda Rudolph reminds us, uh, we have to act today and not tomorrow. Now, uh, the other part of the case for leadership from environmental health is the fact that we really have two parts to ensuring a safe water supply. One of those parts we know very well, and that's our protection efforts, our efforts to protect the existing water supply. This is how most of our water protection programs were developed with a single focus on protecting the supply because for many decades that most of us uh, who have been around for 40 years, for many decades, uh, our water supply was something we really took for granted. And so our efforts were really on protecting it. But we have a dual role here and the other end of it involves developing our water supply so that we have adequate capacity. And again, our focus this morning is going to be on developing alternative sources of water, but there are other uh, efforts that we will cover in subsequent uh, webinars as well. Now, um, the third point here is that resolving the water crisis requires effective communication and with a focus on public health. I think that um, when I look back at the various efforts to address water conservation, I look back at a point where we were really talking about conservation and not really public health as the driver. So I think we have to keep in mind here that public health is really, public health and environmental health is, are really the authorities that have to speak to both the public and our partners if we're going to be successful in developing these alternative water supplies. And then uh, lastly, the water crisis is really equivalent to the sustainability crisis that we're facing in many other arenas. I think we've talked about this in, uh, in previous uh, efforts as well, but this is clearly um, a crisis in sustainability that we really have to deal with. Uh, and let me just make a couple more uh, points about that. I think that um, as um, public health officials, 
including those of us that are working in environmental health, um, it's a much more compelling argument than we will hear from the municipalities. If some of you remember maybe 20, 30 years ago when we were talking about conserving water, it was really based on a conservation theme. And it were, it were statements like, I, the one I recall is put a brick in your toilet, you know, the, your toilet reservoir and you'll save water that way. And now of course we're dealing with um, a crisis that I think increasingly the public is becoming much more focused on. Even the Pope yesterday, as I, I think many of you probably saw the coverage, but the Pope made statements about climate change and references uh, to the need for us to radically change our current practices and move toward a more sustainable uh, world. So um, let me now move to the next slide. And here, as we recall from the first session, the, the statement of the problem and the urgent need to act was certainly made, but we all recognize there are barriers to meeting this need. Some of them are obvious to the public, and to us, and some of them are not so obvious. But the typical ones that we hear about is technology, uh, regulatory constraints, funding, and institutional constraints. And just a quick word on these. My personal view is that technology really is not much of a limitation on us right now compared to the others. I think we have a big task as it relates to regulatory because our framework in water quality has developed over decades and it doesn't really suit the crisis that we have to resolve today in water adequacy, the adequacy of our water supplies. So that whole regulatory system is under strong reform now with you know, tremendous leadership at the state level. And uh, those problems are being tackled, but you know, it sort of relates with the fourth bullet here, institutional constraints, and that is that many of us got our upbringing on water quality. We really weren't thinking about these non-regulatory roles that we are now considering. Our job was really to enforce the regulations. And when individuals or municipalities come to us and say, look, I want to develop an alternative source of water, gray water, storm water, whatever. Our instinct is to look at the threats that that might present to public water supply protection. And that's a natural response from us. But, you know, I think that the institutional barrier as well is going to be addressed by simply informing our workforce and ourselves on the dual nature of our role in this area. And we've got to work together to, to remove those institutional barriers. And I'm confident we can. With regard to funding, the last bullet there, I don't think that's really a current day constraint on us as well. It's, at least it's not the, uh, the critical constraint because there is adequate funding. And I think our real challenge within the state of California is how to use that money in the wisest way possible. I think the state right now and many municipalities are really seeking good answers and the money will flow to fund them. But there's a lot of controversy as we can all imagine in this, this area and that is setting us back somewhat. But um, anyway, I, I think maybe one other thing that's not on the barriers here is public support. And we really do need to make sure the public is informed about the risks of not having adequate water in the future. So that as the municipalities and as government goes forward with additional measures, that support will be there. The support is very high right now, and much higher than it's ever been because people really do recognize the, uh, the current environmental constraints we're under with regard to our uh, sustainable water supply. Okay, let me now move on to uh, highlight the um, let me see, I'm having difficulty transitioning the slide. There we go. So the EH leadership roles, um, there are really a number of roles for us, but we're gonna highlight just the two that we're gonna develop and talk about uh, today. And that is the first being as regulators, we sometimes 
miss the important roles we can play in solving a problem as complex as, as the water crisis. And these two sort of typify uh, what the uh, first two are that we really need to, to focus on. Now, we can help change public messaging on water, which has historically, as I mentioned, been one of conservation. And um, we are the ones that can best do that. So communicating the health implications of the water crisis and the urgency to act is really a public health and environmental health uh, task. And uh, that's the first area. Um, I think part of that has to emphasize that our current water crisis requires urgent action. And that suggests to me that our messaging really has to be driven with public health at the center. Not natural resources, not conservation, but public health and specifically threats to public health and our ability to maintain good public health without an adequate uh, development of our water supply. Um, this is very much like climate change, if, if you think about it, where the shift in focus from the impacts on the natural resources and wildlife to impacts on health really is now fueling strong public and political support on uh, climate action. And as we mentioned, um, the Pope is now engaged on that, and I think that's really huge for uh, moving the, the general public forward. So we need to educate the public on this urgency to act, but at the same time, we have to reach out to our partners in local municipalities to, to dispel the myths that some of them are operating under, that if they come to public health, and I'm talking about the organization or the institution, if they come to public health with a proposal, it's gonna be nothing but barriers and roadblocks for them. We realize that here in, uh, in Los Angeles, and we've done a, a, a much better job in the last five to six years than we did historically and welcome in these types of projects. And we've got to get that message out, dispel the myth that we're not part of the solution. We do see this water capacity as a crisis, and we need to be the ones leading the resolution of the crisis. Okay, now, how do we carry out these roles? There's gonna be a lot of collaboration with uh, water agencies, local municipalities, and our partners in public health. But with that, we're gonna transition now to uh, Carlos, who will um, continue this discussion. Carlos? Uh, good morning, and thanks, uh, Katie and Holly and Angelo, for this opportunity. Um, and hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for taking part of this webinar. Uh, in this session, what I'm going to talk about is how, uh, like Angela said, how environmental health can and should play a leadership role as we face the, this uh, water crisis. Um, and as uh, Katie had mentioned, um, uh, I am the chief of the uh, environmental health program called Cross Connection Water Pollution Control. I've been in this program as a field inspector and then as a technical lead, which we call as a EHS-4. And then as a chief, it's been about 19 years, so I've seen a lot of changes of uh, how um, public health has uh, been uh, involved with uh, the water protection and also this alternate water systems. Um, let me transition to another slide. There we go. Um, as the title of the, of the um, the program I'm in, it's a mouthful, but it pretty much tells it like it is. In a nutshell, um, me and my staff are focused on potable water protection. Now, if you stop and think about the many ways we, as a society, use water, there are just as many ways in which we can change the water composition we are using, and many of those ways even contaminate and thus make it a public health hazard. Um, for example, when you uh, took a shower today, uh, hopefully, uh, potable water coming out of the shower and not so much going down the drain. So it changes. And if you've seen the shower after my sons have taken one, some change the water more than others. Um, but besides that, uh, let me go to this next slide. 
what is driving the development of alternate water systems? Um, when we when we look at the different um, factors that are really uh, creating this um, need for environmental health to be a leader, uh, we can look at uh, environmental and political changes in the area of water resources. Uh, the environment, um, three good reasons, as, as some say in real estate, location, 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 right? Uh, well, here we'll say drought, the drought, and the drought. Um, those those reasons, I mean, this picture that I, I posted up here, um, I just uh, read an article about how housing um, will be affected tremendously with uh, the lack of water. Um, that in itself is, is a huge uh, uh, driving force to make something happen, um, especially in the protection of our water system. There's also uh, public perception. Uh, many, if not the majority of changes, come about when the public cries out for change. Oftentimes, um, that is what motivates our political uh, movers and shakers. Um, which brings us to water rights. We are now seeing in the news that long-standing water rights are now a target for change. Um, the, these types of um, uh, uh, factors make it clear that conservation of our water supplies must be forefront in our efforts while addressing these challenges. Likewise, sustainability has to be principal focus also. Um, someone said lately, uh, you never let a serious crisis go to waste. Uh, and what I mean by that is that this is an opportunity for us to really look into um, how environmental can uh, assist in the crisis that we're, we're facing now. There's also um, that's there's also a, a another factor, which is industry's summons. And I, I use summons in that uh, it's a call, it's a signal, it's an order to do something. It turns out to be lucrative for industry to actually uh, go green. And uh, apparently industry is taking up the charge. Uh, we see projects uh, for LID, a low impact development, uh, leadership in energy and environmental design. Um, in LA City, we've been uh, dealing with standard urban stormwater mitigation plans, which um, also use the alternate water system that they collect. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, going green uh, means practicing an environmentally friendly, ecologically responsible lifestyle, as well as making decisions to help protect the environment and sustain natural resources. So we, we constantly hear these things. Um, uh, so here I've mentioned four dynamic factors all playing a part and each one impacting our role as uh, public health professionals. To protect our drinking water resources, we must uh, make better use of alternate water supplies, uh, which is aligned with protecting and promoting health. Um, Use of alternate water can expose us to infectious agents, um, and I'll get into that a little bit later in regards to the different sources that we're going to um, I'm going to point out. Non-point sources of unknown water quality and chemical exposure. When I say non-point sources, uh, if you don't know what that means, it's uh, where the sources of, of um, non-potable water. Uh, comes from different areas that really can't be pinpointed. Um, for example, gray water, you know where it comes from. Uh, uh, showers, sinks, uh, washing, uh, washing, uh, clothes washing. But uh, other non-point sources may, may be, you know, runoffs um, coming from all different types of sources. Uh, other um, public health roles that we have is, is protect the cross connections to the drinking water supply. Um, let me transition. And what I want to talk about is um, six case studies that we we have uh, 
assisted in as environmental health. Uh, we've directed uh, requirements, um, made the projects go uh, a little bit uh, easier uh, in, re in regards to the uh, protection of public health. Uh, many times um, project proponents do, do not take in, uh, into uh, account how that project may affect uh, exposures uh, to the public. Um, but first, I, I want to give you a brief summary of water sources that make up alternate water supplies. And uh, one thing that I want to uh, emphasize is not all alternate water systems are the same. Uh, the use of one or another has distinct and yet subtle differences that must be considered during risk assessments. And approvals, especially when exposure issues arise and potable water supplies are involved, these alternate water systems are distinct from one another. And due to such differences, they need to be handled according to the differences. So we have um, what makes up alternate water systems is uh, rainwater harvesting and catchment. Uh, when I say harvesting and catchment, um, a lot of the projects we're looking at that are attempting to capture the rainwater, if we had it, um, uh, is actually collecting it and reusing it on site. Uh, a catchment system, on the other hand, we also catch the rainwater, but uh, it's more intended to percolate into the ground so it doesn't run off. Recycled water uh, has been around for many, many years, uh, decades even. Uh, this is our purple pipe system. It's Title 22 which is a uh, uh, California Code of Regulations that regulates that type of uh, water, and which comes from a, a, our wastewater treatment plants. And it's distributed <coughs> through the plumbing system separate from any domestic water supply and reused in golf courses, parks, and we typically see that in, in large uh, landscape irrigation systems. We can also use that for indoor plumbing, uh, toilet, and urinal flushing. Uh, gray water uh, is also another one <coughs> that uh, has been around for a long time, but hasn't been really extensively implemented. Uh, the plumbing code is actually um, making it easier to, to use that. Uh, and um, I'll get into that a little bit later also. Treated gray water is now on the um, it's it's one of the new types of alternate water systems that is allowed in the in the plumbing code, and what that uh, expands the definition of gray water in that we're looking at uh, different sources like foundation drainage, uh, swimming pool uh, drain water, uh, cooling tower uh, uh, blowdown, uh, uh, environment like. Um, AC condensate, all of those uh, can actually be uh, collected, uh, treated, and reused. And and this is one of those uh, new developments in the plumbing code that uh, actually is expanding the amount of projects that, w that we're looking at. Uh, stormwater is the next one uh, for alternate water systems. Um, very distinct in itself, uh, apart from all the others, because what it does is it collects a lot of the, uh, the chemicals and, and, and contaminants that are on the, on the uh, uh, storm drain systems. Uh, urban runoff is similar to stormwater. Uh, it doesn't come from a rain event necessarily, but um, the amount of urban runoff that we see is a large amount of, of runoff, uh, and uh, it's uh, surprising how much during uh, dry weather, how much urban runoff is actually going down um, the storm drains. Industrial sources um, is another alternate water system that, or supplies that uh, we can make use of. And I, and I put here reclaimed water, which is another uh, word for recycled water in the code. Uh, but I'm using it here as uh, an industry that's actually reclaiming process water. Uh, for their their own industrial purposes, they can reclaim it to use in, in other uses within the the, uh, uh, the system that their um, business or industry. 
Um, rainwater harvesting. I'm going to go through a, a, the, a couple of the um, uh, pictures here just to give you an idea. Um, rainwater harvesting and catchment. It's uh, you know here we have a picture of a nice uh, setup. It's a cistern collects water from the the roof, has a uh, first flush system on the left hand side. Um, this is probably used for landscape irrigation. It's on site collection and use. Uh, this type of system can be actually very clean water source, uh, depending on the design, depending on the um, the, the materials used for the, the uh, roofs where it collects. Um, a lot of this, uh, uh, these projects really comes to us and it can be approved very easily. Uh, recycled water again, uh, purple pipe, regulated. Uh, it's a very consistent water quality. Its uh, reliability is high, but the availability is limited um, due to the um, the piping system going through municipalities. Uh, if somebody uh, wanted to use recycled water uh, because of this uh, water crisis that we're in, take for example um, uh, maybe a cemetery that's within the, the confines of a, a, uh, the city where recycled water hasn't got to yet. Uh, they're dying to use the recycled water, um, but it's not available. Um, and I put down here that uh, availability is limited unless indirect potable reuse. And that indirect potable reuse is actually something that we can inject the, the recycled water within um, uh, spreading grounds that percolates in the ground, which uh, in turn um, uh, resupplies our aquifers. And in that way, the availability of water becomes much more uh, uh, broad, much more available. Um, currently used in all types of irrigation, urinal, toilet flushing, as well as in industrial application. Excuse me, Carlos. Um, I, yep. This is the eight-minute warning you wanted. Okay. Um, gray water, also called gray water. Um, th these are, uh, as the picture shows, a lot of the um, uh, systems here would, would uh, go from closed washer. A lot of it is not, doesn't need to be. Um, permitted if it's uh, a very simple system and that's in the plumbing code. I'm going to really scan through this. Treated gray water on the other hand is all these different uh, sources that's treated and then reused in uh, for uh, toilet flushing, even clothes washing. But here again, treated gray water has to be regulated because of the exposure. Uh, again, storm water. Um, picks up a lot of the uh, biological loading and chemical contaminant, um, urban runoff as well. Industrial sources. I'm going to just skim through this because I want to get to the case studies. Um, the rainwater harvesting matrix that we developed back in uh, 2011 was another collaboration that uh, how Angelo had mentioned that uh, we work with a lot of different agencies to come up with this. Uh, this matrix uh, is available online, and it is intended uh, to use for these projects to, to get these projects moving because we didn't have anything to go on at the time. Now the plumbing code has, has actually caught up and um, is filling the gaps. Uh, we broke it down into a couple, couple different tiers. Uh, tier 1 is rain barrels, which we don't want to uh, heavily regulate. But there are safety issues. Um, tier two, uh, we broke that down into on site collection, on site use. This is Compton Creek Park, large cisterns collecting on site uh, water to re be re reused in irrigation systems. And this is one of those where we helped um, to ensure that the uh, uh, public is being protected by the, the design of the, of the project. Uh, tier three is off-site collection, on-site use. We don't have a lot of those. Uh, schools are intending to use that, but they're being hung up by the treatment that is necessary for stormwater or urban runoff. Um, obviously, we don't want to have kids be exposed to this without proper treatment. So those are, are just coming on, on, the, on the scene, but not yet. 
Tier 4 is, is for large um, uh, cisterns. Um, and I'll, I'll get to a case study, which is really interesting. Uh, let me just go through this. Um, obviously, pot potential benefits. Uh, we want to promote the construction of more alternate water systems. Um, obviously, this is going to prevent a lot of the harmful uh, pollution, uh, conserve our drinking water, and it also mitigates flooding. Uh, if we ever have the rain. Uh, here's uh, case study number one where uh, the project proponent came to us and said, we want to collect all the uh, runoff off these roofs and use it. Um, this is a 5,000 gallon holding tank. Uh, it has four bladders. It's uh, passive uh, a filtration. Uh, it's, it's one of those in industry that uh, we uh, looked at and approved. Here's a, a Penmar stormwater capture. This is at the, the tail end of um, Santa Monica Airport. This captures a lot of the uh, runoff before it gets into the bay. And the intent was to actually collect it uh, and send it on to Hyperion treatment plant um, so that it doesn't get into the bay as just uh, untreated runoff. Phase two on this project, um, which is now being implemented, is actually uh, to treat the collected water and reuse it in the parks, reuse it in the golf course, uh, and distribute it to other uh, parcels. So this is actually very exciting in, in that it's pushing the boundaries of, of uh, the code, uh, but it's also helping us to collaborate with the cities that are actually doing this. Uh, case study number three is the Hilton Foundation. This is in Agora. Uh, they came to us saying that they wanted to use multiple sources of alternate water, recycle water, on-site rainwater catchment. Um, a, they were drilling a well, a uh, non-potable uh, irrigation well. They were going to use the different waters to actually uh, commingle those. And, and because they had sensitive plants, they wanted to fluctuate the amount of recycle water or rainwater uh, or well water. Uh, recycled water, if anybody, if you guys know, is heavy in salt, so it might uh, uh, be harmful to uh, just newly planted uh, plants vegetation. Very interesting building. It actually, one side note, uh, it doesn't have an AC unit, uh, mechanical. It does it all by design. So, uh, and they they give uh, tours of this. So I encourage you guys, to anybody to go and look at this. Very very nice building. It's a, a lead platinum, I believe. Uh, case study number four. This is a Hotel Bel Air, which um, they want to do a, a treated gray water for ir irrigation and also for future use for toilet urinal flushing. But at the time, the code didn't allow it. But we were able to work with LA City uh, Building and Safety to actually uh, do this as a pilot project. Uh, so they were only using it for irrigation and pulling water samples off of this just to make sure that the treatment system was uh, on par with uh, Title 22, which is the standard for um, like recycled water. Now, uh, in the meantime, this uh, pilot project uh, was being tested. Now a new standard comes on the forefront, which is NSF 350 and 350-1 which actually um, mimics Title 22, but it has different monitoring and reporting requirements. It makes these projects a lot easier to uh, approve. Very nice building. Uh, we're seeing more of these. We're seeing uh, uh, new construction, uh, Waldorf Astoria, downtown LA, that is uh, also trying to do these uh, alternate water systems. Uh, so it's very exciting to look at the uh, designs for these projects coming to us uh, looking for how uh, public health can be protected, how they uh, can implement the, the requirements because a lot of times the, the building and safety departments recognize that public health needs to be involved, especially after the approval of these projects. Once that they're done, building and safety uh, hands it off to public health to actually do the reporting and monitoring on the long term. Uh, tree people is case study number five. This is a large um, cistern, 250,000 gallon cistern up on uh, uh, Coldwater Canyon. 
And this is their main headquarters. It's a demonstration project. Uh, they're demonstrating how to do this. Um, they give tours. Uh, this is another one that I encourage everybody to, to go look at. It's, it's uh, a wonderful uh, project. And uh, we had um, caught on to this project when they were being built, so they never came to us for uh, a plan approval. Uh, we caught it just in time to make sure that the, the requirements were being met. So this is another one where uh, a lot of the industry didn't know that they had to come to public health. Um, and uh, now the word is out, and we were able to give these requirements uh, for these projects, which is a, a, a hard thing to do if you if it's if you you're not out there. And uh, you know if we, if building and safety is collaborating with us, the word is out uh, makes it much more easier to to get these things going. This is uh, Santa Monica Urban Runoff Recycling Facility, it's, uh, SMURF for short. Uh, this collects a lot of urban runoff uh, from Bayonne Creek. Um, this was intended just to be a demonstration project, but it turned out to be something uh, that's run 365 days out of the year because uh, they're actually using it for toilet urine flushing in, in uh, a couple of the buildings in Santa Monica. So it has to keep on, on rolling. It has to keep on producing. Uh, when it rains, this actually uh, shuts down uh, because it's not a stormwater uh, uh, recycling facility. It's urban runoff. And this uh, actually went through a um, regional board for uh, permitting through a uh, uh, building. It wasn't through permitting, but it, it went through um, best management practices because uh, regional board couldn't uh, classify the water supplies as uh, from a wastewater stream. So those these projects actually push the boundaries of even the regional board to rethink uh, of how their uh, permitting process needs to include these projects. One last thing, uh, and I, this is what I want to leave uh, everyone with is, and I just want to read this. Uh, the role of managing risks that arise from connecting various water sources has now significantly increased. Uh, the contribution of well-trained and competent plumbers cannot be overstated. And, and that also means uh, for us as professionals in environmental health, we also need to be competent in the projects that are coming our way. Poorly installed and maintained systems could easily deteriorate into disease proliferation conditions similar to those seen before the advent of plumbing and all its protection. Now, that, this uh, uh, statement came from uh, one that w was uh, Australia's water crisis, and they went through a huge water crisis. Uh, and so these things are lessons that we can learn from others that have gone through the similar conditions we are now faced with. Understanding the risks and hazards that can affect our health will help find solutions in the proper use of these alternate water systems and ultimately help conserve our water resources. So I also um, want to finish by uh, you know, thanking Katie and Holly once again and also Angelo. That was great. Thank you so much, Carlos. This is Carla Blackmar, <clears throat> the Alliance Project Manager again, and I really appreciate both your presentation and Angelo's. This was fascinating. Um, so we already have a few questions coming in on the question bar. One is, um, can you share the latest on desalination efforts? Is that con considered an AWS method? I would say that it's it actually the uh, desal um, would develop into drinking water uh, standard. It wouldn't be necessarily a a alternate water system because the intent for desal is to actually produce domestic water. Um, there's all uh, different um, problems with desal, but as you know, as a a citizen, uh, we look up to the ocean and say, why are we in the, a drought when we have all this water? But there are very many uh, uh, factors in, 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 the, 
implementation of DCEL. That's great. Um, all right, and then a, a subsequent question uh, coming from Michelle Bilodeau. Um, do you have an ordinance to regulate ongoing monitoring and maintenance of an alternative water system? Right now, the the plumbing code leaves it at um, the monitoring and reporting is going to be uh, managed by the public health authority having jurisdiction, which really doesn't say a whole lot. Um, and this is one of those where we're working with the governor's office um, through uh, Assembly Bill 1463 to actually um, put some language together uh, so that there's consistency throughout the state for reporting and monitoring of these alternate water systems. Currently, it's um, a very piecemeal across the state uh, regarding whoever's approving these projects to actually look at them and say, well, we're going to do it either quarterly or we're going to do it uh, you know, every month. Um, we certainly don't want to be uh, burdensome uh, in regards to reporting and monitoring, but we also want to make sure that the systems that we do approve uh, are staying the same way as we approve them over the long term. So look look at AB 1463. We actually have a follow-up question on AB 1463. Um, so they're basically asking, you know, does it remove regulatory barriers to alternative water sources? Um, or alternate water sources. I think there's some question about whether, it, or maybe the nature of it, is it meant to sort of tighten up the, um, it sounds like what you're saying is it will provide consistency, but I think the question is asking, will it also be removing barriers to those types of water sources? Well, right now, the, the language of 1463, uh, the one that came to me is very uh, general, and right now they're putting specifics into that uh, that bill. I haven't read the latest. Um, whether it um, uh, removes uh, the hindrances to approving these, the hindrances is, are, are pretty much um, what we see already is what is the source, what is the, the application of the water supply, how is that um, uh, going to be uh, an exposure risk, uh, those elements. Um, it doesn't necessarily speak on those. Uh, those are things that we need to look at and evaluate. Uh, if those are hindrances, okay, so be it, but uh, those are still uh, public health issues that we need to look at. That's great. Okay, so we have another question coming through from Faradin Zulkik. I'm sorry if I've done a terrible job on the name. Recent studies showed that California can save up to 70% of its 75% of its water supply by using field liners and farmland, floppy sprinklers, and big data, precise calculations when big fields should be watered. As we know, farmland using, is used, currently using about 80% of all water. Um, and that seems like more of a comment than a question. Um, but I think it's just a, a, it just seems like a general question about, um, you know, how is this being, or do you guys have any experience with the agricultural context, um, considering that that's a substantial water user? And, and I might just jump in quickly and say that we do have other tracks of the series that are going to be more honed in on agricultural water use, and so that might be another place to have that discussion. But um, do you guys have any initial thoughts or comments on that one? Well, the only comment I have on that is that that's another um, area where we're in crisis because uh, agriculture has uh, been traditionally one of those where it's hands off. You, you, you don't want to regulate the amount of water that uh, they're using. But now those water rights are being uh, uh, scrutinized. And um, so that's part of the problem. I mean, uh, we're, uh, we're California is a uh, like number one producer for a lot of the different agriculture. Uh, so if we cut that off, we're, we're cutting off our uh, uh, parts of our economy. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, how do we regulate the amount of water that's going to these farmlands, um, which hasn't been done before? 
So it, it's a it's a balancing act. And again, I think that's something we're going to be discussing over the course of the series, um, both in in this environmental health series, but we also have two other series that we're going to be um, doing. One is on public, raising, basically on agricultural and public health um, and water, and another one is on sort of public health leadership in general. And um, we will send out notifications for um, series that are potentially overlapping in their scope of interest. So um, I just wanted to maybe ask one other quick question, um, just to sort of wrap it up, and this goes back to uh, Angela's presentation. How do we think that the role of the environmental health director will change in the future, um, you know, in, in relation to some of these topics we've been discussing today? And what are some of the qualities and characteristics you think this person will need to embody in order to um, keep up with sort of the quickly changing environment related to water management? Yeah, I think the quick answer there, uh, Carla, is that we've got to be um, we've got to be diligent in fulfilling our regulatory role, but we have to become very adept in handling the non-regulatory parts of the solution, and and that's really another way of saying that not everything that is needed to be done is in code. There's a lot of participation and a lot of work for us to do in areas that are not part of a code. And so that's a new skill that we have to learn, which is how do we work with a diverse group of stakeholders to come up with a management plan for a lot of these issues we're talking about. The, the question that was raised just a couple of minutes ago about the farmland and ag use, that, that is the $64,000 question. So what we've got to be driven toward in the state of California, and locals have to be active in this debate, is that what is the appropriate manner in which to manage this very limited resource? If you think about it, Southern California developed on the basis of imported water. The system was, you know, it was jinxed from the beginning because we assumed that this flow of imported water would continue indefinitely and that's really what we're bumping into now. The suppliers of that water are having their own crises, and we've got to develop these alternative methods. And, and I think the central message that I wanted to leave with the group is that this dual role is very important. While we have to speak to the adequacy of our water supply and work to enhance it, we also have to make sure we get it right. If not, we're going to jeopardize public health. So this dual role is one where if we don't develop our water supply, public health is in jeopardy. If we move to develop it, but we don't do it right, then the public health protections that we are faithfully executing might fail. So this is a very difficult task. And I think in general, our role has to be one where we're working with diverse stakeholder groups and we're, we, we're acknowledging that we can't solve everything with the existing regulations and that we need strong reform in this area that's driven by public health and science, good science, and not s strictly on past practice. Well, those are some great closing words and um, a great answer to our questions. So thank you again so much, Angelo and Carlos, for your wonderful presentations today and for getting our environmental health series off to a great start. Um, oh, sorry, keep going too quickly. I just want to remind everybody that we have some more fascinating topics that delve into some of these issues. Um, so in July, we're going to be talking about regulating rainwater and stormwater capture. So again, sort of getting into some of the details that we saw in the overview today. Um, so please go ahead and look at this URL. Have a, uh, have a look and consider joining some of the other webinars in the series. Again, as I mentioned, in addition to this series on environmental health and water, we have two other series that are running at the same time. One is on, um, again, the water crisis strategies for public health leaders, and the other is on drought, climate, and the food we eat, which, again, has more of that agricultural focus. So that may be an area that you could be interested in. Um, so, and finally, just to wrap it up today, I want to thank um, Holly Calhoun and Katie Mammon for their wonderful organization um, of this webinar today and for our entire series. They've been doing a great job. Um, and again, thank you to our presenters and a reminder that the recording and slides for this presentation will be available shortly at our website, phasocal.org. So, and if you have further questions or if you want to continue this discussion, go ahead and email our project um, water initiative coordinator on this topic. 
um, and her email is right there. It's, it's Katie Mommen. Thank you again. Have a great day, everyone.